In this series, we cover the many products, promos, and pack-ins available to support Dungeon Masters and players within the world of Eberron. And in this video, I'm covering miniatures created for grid-based role-playing of characters and monsters over many iterations of the game by Wizards of the Coast and licensees like WizKids and Galeforce 9. This is the Eberron Collector. To this point, I haven't covered any of the Warforged miniatures available, and as they are the most iconic player race associated with Eberron, I felt like I should get to at least one group of them, and start with arguably the most iconic Warforged character of them all, the Lord of Blades. The Lord of Blades is a figure shrouded in mystery. Nobody knows their origin. There are rumors, and I will cover those later. But what is known is that this figure appeared after the Day of Mourning and has gathered a group of Warforged followers who operate out of the Mornland. These Warforged, who are called the Blades, have taken nationalistic stances towards freedom with their Warforged brethren and use various techniques up to and including violent terrorism to free Warforged who remain in servitude and create a new national homeland for themselves. Some of the Blades are so fanatical that they literally worship the Lord of Blades, and some of them even receive divine magical power through this devotion. There's no way to fully corroborate the many rumors regarding the Lord of Blades history. Not even the best spies of the many nations and Dragonmark houses have been able to positively confirm their identity before they became the Warforged Messiah. Well, let's examine some of the more common theories. Many of those look at a number of notable but now missing Warforged. The Siren hero named Bastion and the Siren commander named Rampart are both common ideas. Both presumably died in the Day of Mourning and both would have been able to be charismatic and knowledgeable enough to lead the activities of large groups of soldiers and plan terrorist attacks. But no concrete evidence points to them. Another popular figure is that of Bulwark, the Warforged bodyguard of King Bornal of Breland. It's believed that Bornal's push to legally free the Warforged from servitude in the Thronehold Treaty was primarily due to influence from Bulwark as one of Bornal's best friends. Also, Bulwark disappeared shortly after the signing of the treaty. As an already prominent figure, trained fighter, and strong advocate for Warforged rights, who had already amassed a small number of followers before the disappearance due to his role in the freeing of Warforged, there is a good reason that this claim on the identity of the Lord of the Blades has its promoters. Yet, there are still a number of others. There's one theory that some believe is a bit more outlandish, is that the Lord of Blades is not a Warforged at all, but actually Aaron de Caneth, father of the current leader of Caneth South, Marix, and the man whose research turned the simple response behavior of those early Warforged Titans and other prototypes created by Aaron's father, who was also named Marix. However, not long after his magical accomplishments were made, Aaron protested the use of his new creations in the war, and was subsequently excoriated from the house and disappeared. If he is the Lord of Blades, he's constructed a suit of armor to look like a Warforged. Or perhaps he is a Master Maker and has replaced parts of his body with Warforged components. See also my review of Magic of Aberron for more about the Renegade Master Maker. One of the major supports for this theory is that there are rumors that the Lord of Blades is illegally running a Creation Forge deep in the Mornlands, making the first new Warforged since the treaty was signed. A Dragonmark member of the line of Caneth would be needed to run the Creation Forge, and if Aaron is the Lord of Blades, 
he'd be able to do that himself instead of kidnapping or otherwise coercing a member of House Canif to run the forge for them. The other rumors on the Lord of Blades identity are a little less concrete. Just things like the Lord was the last Warforge to come off the Creation Forge after Thronehold, or that there isn't just one Lord of Blades, but many Warforge revolutionaries are all using the same moniker. It's really just not clear which, if any, of these rumors are the truth. Or it's possible that none of them are actually true. What is clear enough is the first Lord of Blade miniature that was released. It came to us in November 2006's Blood War set for the D&D miniatures game as a rare. There were two versions of the stat card for the miniature, one that came with it in the booster pack intended for standard play, and a special promotional epic version intended for a special epic format that also allowed much larger and more powerful creatures in the warband. This promo was given out for in-store league play of the miniatures game. The sculpt is not based on either of the earlier appearing pieces of art for the Lord of Blades, but instead had concept art done by Thomas M. Baxa, which can be best seen on the back of the epic stat card. The design is still reasonably close. It is simplified from Matt Cavada's cover art in Dungeon 111, especially in the weapon where it went from the unique multi-bladed design to a simple two-bladed sword. This issue of Dungeon had a feature on the Lord of Blades as part of Eberron previews. So we got to see the Lord of Blades before we even got to see the rest of the setting, actually. Because it came out about six months before the Eberron campaign setting itself. The Lord was given stats as a second level fighter, multiclassed with five levels of Artificer and five levels of the Warforged Juggernaut Prestige class. The magazine gives the full stats but the campaign setting did give the same summary of the class levels of Lord when it did eventually come out months later. The miniature stat card replicated a truncated version of the stats from the magazine. The challenge rating of the Lord from 3.5 edition was 12, so set up as a adversary situated squarely to the midpoint of a campaign expected to go to the 20th level and not dip into the epic level handbook to go higher. The followers of the Lords of Blades, or just Blades, are zealous warforged who have religious fervor for their Lord's ideas and instructions, treating any word as scripture. Those words are generally about the superiority of warforged over the quote-unquote fleshy people of the world. One of the core tenets of this belief system is that organic life created the Warforges weapons. So they will be weapons. They will conquer Corvair and eventually subjugate all of Eberron, including their creators. And the Lord of Blades will rule them as god and king. The Blades have a secret base of operations somewhere in the Mornland from which they run their missions of both military and proselytizing natures. The location is secret and possibly moves around itself. Or due to the nature of the Mornland, perhaps the lands move around the base. Either way, every major Cyan city and Kenneth's facility as well have been rumored to house this base of operations. From that base, there are evangelical blades who leave and spread the word of the Lord of the Blades to any Warforged who will listen, getting them to abandon their lives as mercenaries or laborers, especially those still under brutal contracts as indentured servants. I will eventually cover the blades as a religion in more detail in a future video. 
Like I mentioned when talking about how Warforged get their names in the last Library of Kornberg episode, many blades take on new names to reflect that they are weapons to be used by the Lord of Blades, and they use the names of bladed weapons or similar things. There are a number of examples of Blade's adversaries and other NPCs from a number of Eberron adventures, especially the early ones. Notably the character of Cutter and Saber in the Forgotten Forge in the Eberron campaign setting itself, Cutlass from Shadow of the Last War, Whispers of the Vampire's Blade, and Grasp of the Emerald Claw featured Sumitar, and the Warforge focused adventure Steel Shadows from dungeon number 115 featured some blades as well. This miniature, I believe, is the most iconic physical version of the Lord of Blades, and it appeared in WizKids product line, D&D Icons of the Realms, specifically the Aberon Rising from the Last War expansion set. The Lord of Blades figure is a rare in the set, which released March 2020. This miniature clearly used the classic Lord of Blades art by Steve Prescott that appeared in September 2005's Five Nations, and was reused in November 2019's Eberron Rising from the Last War as its concept art. The new look carried forward from that illustration to all subsequent Lord of Blades art, including the 4th edition versions, which we'll look at later, and this other piece from Rising from the Last War. Unlike the last mini, on this one, the blades on the Lord's body are curved, which they were even back in the Dungeon 111 art, though a little less so, and the double sword actually has the multiple blades as shown in all of the art pieces. Looking at the 5th edition stats to go with this mini, it's very clearly inspired by the Lord's abilities in 3rd edition. It focuses on charging for melee combat, like the Warforged Juggernaut, and it has some spellcasting abilities from being an artificer. I might focus your attention to one of the spells specifically in the spell list, Mordenkainen's Faithful Hound. I believe it's there specifically to emulate a feature that was used in both the 3rd and 4th edition versions of the character, the Homunculi of the Lord, and you can use the spell to simulate it. I'm going to talk specifically about the Homunculi in a moment, but I might recommend allowing the Lord to summon two of the Faithful Hounds and not make them invisible, as the spell normally is. The 5th edition stat block is CR18, so it's an adversary intended to help close out a campaign headed towards the level 20 cap at the end of 5th edition. Hilt and Pommel are the homunculus companions of the Lord of Blades. As an artificer, the Lord of Blades constructed these bits of artificial life and they are constant companions to the Lord, and important parts of any combat with the Warforged leader. Historically, a homunculus is a small creature created from some part of the alchemist, their blood or flesh, something like that. In D&D though, they are small servants created by spellcasters to spy, assist with rituals and other non-combat tasks that the spellcaster might require with similar material requirements. The Artificer class in 3.5 gained a Craft Homunculus ability, which let them make these constructs even without the normal feats required to do so. Plus, the campaign setting book contained a number of special homunculi that could be made, like the Iron Defender that inspired 5th edition's Steel Defender, among a few more specialized variants. Homunculi have changed a little in D&D over the years, and Hilt and Pommel have changed alongside, though not in the same ways. Let me show you some of the monster manual images for Homunculi from 3rd, 4th, and 5th editions. The 
the creature shown on the Dungeon 111 cover as Hilton Pommel don't have much direct relationship to those other representations of homunculi. I'd say they actually look closer to what you'd get if you made an armored, winged, and binocular variation of a homunculus from the Magic the Gathering world of Ravnica, most iconically shown on the card Totally Lost, showing the character of Fibblethip. Now, interestingly, the world of Ravnica and much of Aberon material were developed at Wizards of the Coast around the same time. Ravnica debuted in fall 2005, and the dungeon issue that featured Hilton Pommel was April 2004. Magic set development generally takes two or more years in total, so there may have been some development overlap. And the illustrator of the cover was noted D&D and magic artist Matt Gavada, who was Magic's creative lead from 2004 to 2006. However, the first time the iconic look for Ravnica's homunculi was shown on cards was until many years later. Back to Hilton Pommel themselves. There is evidence that the Lord greatly trusts these followers based on entrusting them both with magical armor plus additional magic gear. They did evolve with the times, so they received a major look and power upgrade in 4th edition, plus a bit of a PR boost, going from the cover of a dungeon magazine to appearing alongside the Lord on the cover of the Eberron campaign guide itself. Here, we see that they've lost their wings and are modeled directly after the monster, the Steel Predator, from 4th edition's Monster Manual 2. And as a note, that monster also appears in 3rd edition's Teen Folio and 5th edition's Morden Kynan's Tome of Foams. To quote the book, Hilton Pommel, two homunculi created by the Lord of Blades, are smaller copies of the fearsome Steel Predator. The constructs are sized up to medium from 3rd edition's small-sized homunculi, though they're still sized down from the actual Steel Predator, which is large in all three editions. Hilt and Pommel have not been converted to 5th edition, and neither physical form has received miniatures to go alongside the three versions of the actual lore. So looking at the last Lord of Blades miniature, which is the first unpainted mini we've covered on this channel so far, it was released in May 2020 as a standalone release. The miniature on screen is among the first few I ever painted, coming less than two months from the first I painted at the initial onset of the COVID-19 pandemic. So I can see faults in the paint that I probably should fix up, but this is still a reasonable representation of what can be done with the mini. But I'll stick up the promotional photo of the professionally painted version to compare to as well. As I mentioned, the mini came in a standalone box, so let me show you what that looks like, and read to you from the text from the back. The Lord of Blades is a Warforged Warlord who has broken all ties to his former masters. He has established a nation for his people deep in the Mornland, centered in a great fortress where Warforged from all over Corvair can come and feel a sense of belonging. Tales of his deeds have spread throughout the lands, making him a beacon for Warforged everywhere. This miniature is made of a high quality, if brittle, resin, so sculpted details are very well pronounced, but it is brittle enough that if it takes a light fall, thinner parts may break. And it is completely unprimed when it arrives, so it will need some treatment, i.e. primer, before you can proceed with any sort of painting. Unlike most miniatures we cover, we know that this mini was sculpted by Roy Gabriel based on credits on the box. 
I don't know which art Roy Bass to sculpt on, as the mini is not a direct translation of any specific piece, but this mini feels a lot closer, in my view, to the depiction of the Lord in 4th edition more than any others, especially from the cover of the campaign guide we already saw, though not hunched over like on the cover itself. But especially this piece, showing the Lord in front of throngs of Warforged supporters. In 4th edition, the Lord was a 21st level elite soldier enemy, so good for closing out a 20th level campaign. Or the end of a Paragon stage of play, if you are going to the 30th level epic limits of 4th edition. The stats did keep the aspects of focusing on charging from 3rd edition, and this stat block is where the unique weapon the Lord of Blade wields was named the Six Blade. But the only real nod to them being an artificer is the Lord of Constructs ability, which healed allied constructs. As you have seen, all three versions of the stats have the Lord of Blades as a medium creature, but this mini is on a base that is just shy of one and a half inches, or about 38 millimeters, which is actually the size of large sized bases in the early D&D miniature sets. Not only that, the scale of the figure itself is a fair bit bigger. The mini is just over two inches tall, about 52 millimeters, which is a bit more than a full head taller than either of the other Lord of Blade minis. This miniature is the only one of these that has any sort of decoration on the base as well, where there are mechanical parts and metal detritus on the ground. I would surmise it was intended to show the ground of a ruin in the Mornland. The base and the rest of the mini are cast as part of the same mold, and not as separate parts like all the minis from the D&D miniatures game and WizKids. Okay, so that's all three minis we're covering today. Let me put them on the screen together here, so you can compare them a little more directly side by side. And while I myself have all three versions, I don't necessarily recommend that you get them all as well. If you're looking to get just one, get the WizKids pre-painted option. In my opinion, that's the most accurate sculpt, and it has a decent paint job to start with, despite slightly too many brassy accents, in my opinion. And I do believe it would take a repaint quite well if you want to give it one. But if you're going to collect them all, there is a utility to that. In the original Eberron campaign setting, there is a concept that they introduced there. The recurring villain. Basically a foe that the party faces off against multiple times over the course of a campaign. Like in a pulp serial, each time the villain comes back and grows in power alongside the party. The Lord of Blades is a perfect candidate for that. And I seem to remember something about Keith Baker, or maybe another Eberron writer, writing something about that, using the Lord as a recurring villain as an example at some point but I couldn't find it in the course of the research for this video. Anyway, you would need to make stats for each version that the party encounters. In terms of 5th edition, I'd aim the D&D Miniatures version of the mini to be around CR 10 and be involved in the first big encounter with the Lord when the party is around level 6 to 8, depending on how hard you want the fight to be. I'd include a small-sized Hilton Pommel alongside this Lord, mobbed visually after their appearance on the cover of Dungeon 111. Then, for the Rising from the Last War figure, that would be the mid-range version. You'd use the stats from Rising from the Last War and make up medium-sized stats based on the Steel Predator out of the Tome of Foes, but scaled down to CR 10 to 12 or so. I'd be looking to have this encounter around players level 13, maybe a little higher. The 5e CR system is not exactly precise after all. And then the ultimate version of the Lord of Blades with the CR in the mid 20s and upgraded to large size, that would be the Gale Force 9 mini. Hilton Pommel would also be large size at this point, and you could just straight up use the standard Steel Predator stats right out of Morden Kynan's tome for them, 
and use existing steel predator minis too if you want. This would be the final fight of the campaign where the Lord of Blades is finally defeated and the characters are somewhere around between levels 17 and 20. With that, let's start wrapping things up. I am quite fond of the Lord of the Blades. There's mystery and fanaticism and more. The Lord of Blades can be a figure of evil or a figure like Magneto from X-Men Media, who has, as one of my favorite podcasts says, made some valid points, as the idea of Warforged liberation is an objectively good thing, but the Lord of Blades goes about it using methods we're clearly meant to find despicable. There's elements of the history I want to explore further, too. For example, the character of Bulwark has especially always been of interest to me. I think there could be a very fun short campaign written about a young King Boronel, his paramour the Valinar Al Aliri, Bulwark, and his other unknown companions, adventuring in Zendrik at some point shortly after he was crowned in 961 has to be somewhere around then, as, of course, the first Warforged were not created until 965, so we'd have to have it somewhere between 965 and before he gets too old. The adventure would be kind of a last hurrah before the new king settles into his new role. If someone wrote an adventure with that premise, that you play as these characters... I think it would be a great way to explore Bulwark's potential future as the Lord of Blades. And some interesting things between Illyria and the King, knowing that they're not going to end up together, and things like that. But I would absolutely want to play through that story. Is there an aspect of the Lord of Blades that you would want to explore in a campaign? Also, do you agree with me that the WizKids figure is the best option as miniatures go? please let me know in the comments. I will eventually cover the Lord in more detail in a dedicated Library of Kornberg video about the Warforged leader at some point, but for now, let's leave it there. Thanks so much for your continued support and understanding on delays while I am dealing with my ongoing health issues. As it goes far, this one will take less than a quarter of the time for the previous video. Next time, I do want to start off a new subseries in the Library of Kornberg, Everyone's Monster Manual A to Z, where I go through the core monster manual and talk about each monster in alphabetical order as they come, and of course go over their canon role or roles within the setting. So subscribe so you don't miss out on that episode, where I cover the first two A's, Aarakocras and Ableths. As well, don't forget that Eberron Archaeologist is on Instagram and Twitter. I have a feature on Instagram where I show off an Eberron mini every week, usually ones I haven't featured in a video yet, and both accounts post channel news and whenever a new video goes live. Links to both are in the video description. 